Hi, welcome to Edible Education. I'm Liz Carlisle, and I'm here today with Paul Greenberg, the author of Four Fish and the American Catch. Paul, first off, I want to ask you, how did you get so interested in fish? Well, it kind of comes from divorce, um, <laughs> <laughs> if truth be told. Um, when my parents divorced when I was very young, about three years old, my father, who was like a classic Mad Men era dad, didn't really know what you were supposed to do with two boys on the weekend. And, um, you know, he thought that fishing was a sort of manly thing to do. And actually, he'd always wanted his dad to take his, him fishing, but my grandfather always got seasick. So my dad, I felt like, I think he felt like this was a chance for him to do my his own dad one better and really raise us up manly. And so I really took to it. Um, and, you know, I always feel that it's almost a genetic thing, those who take to fishing and also hunting. Um, and those who don't, and I, I, I have that gene, I suppose. So you've been educating people all over the world about how we can eat fish in a way that helps us better fit into our ecosystems. And this is an idea that we talk about a lot in the food system, but maybe not so much when we think about our seafood. It's true. I mean, I was actually speaking, um, last year I had coffee with Michael Pollan, and we were talking about you know food systems and stuff like that. And you know, I feel like I've been doing pretty well um, doing what I'm doing. But then I look at Michael and Michael, you know, has this, you know, huge message. And then I thought about it and I thought, you know, the average American eats 200 pounds of land food meat per year and only 15 pounds of seafood meat. And I have a feeling that kind of is the way that, you know, Michael's <laughs> echo chamber and my echo chamber, um, which I think actually is kind of unfortunate because I think there's a way to up our seafood consumption. I'm actually working on a book right now called The Omega Principle about omega-3 fatty acids, and I'm doing a self-test where I am only eating seafood for an entire year, and I've actually seen pretty substantial health improvements. So what kind of seafood are you eating? How do we eat seafood in a way that's better in harmony with the planet, with our nutritional needs, with the carrying capacity, if you will, of our planet? Well, there are a couple of issues. I mean, there's the sustainability question, and then there's the local question, which is a community sustainability question. And um, with fisheries, they're often more at odds than, say, with the land food movement. You know, nobody would ever dispute the value of a local land food farmer, right? It's good to have pasture-raised animals. It's good to have organic broccoli being grown. But in the seafood space, as they say out here in the <laughs> Bay Area, um, even the most very gentle practices like oyster farming, for example, I know you had the issue up here in Drake's Bay, but all throughout the East Coast as well, oyster farmers who, to my mind, are doing an ecological service by providing growing creatures that filter and clean the water, provide structure and habitat for other animals. It's a great source of protein, muscles very high in omega-3s, all these things, and yet they're often involved in these NIMBY issues and not allowed to do their trade. So I guess, back to your question though, um, I have kind of a, you know, a, a pollen-esque, if you will, um, three for of what I say that Amer what the way Americans should eat, and it's um, eat American seafood. Um, that's number one. Why? Because uh, the United States has some of the best fisheries management policies in the world. Um, it's always ranked in the top five. Um, so since we're Americans, we should eat American seafood. And I should point out, ninety percent of the seafood Americans eat is imported. Mm. But meanwhile, we're exporting about a third of what we catch. All this really great protein is getting sent to other countries. So eat American seafood. Um, number two is a much broader variety of it than we currently do. Um, right now, um, more than half of the 15 pounds that Americans eat is really just four creatures, um, shrimp, salmon, tuna, um, and then um, it's actually Alaska pollock is the fourth most common consumed seafood. People don't know what it is, but it's actually, you ever had a, well, you ever had a California roll in your Yes. Time on Earth. So the, the center of the California roll is that fake crab, which is actually Pollock. And those who are fans of Curb Your Enthusiasm might remember <laughs> that um, Larry David and his wife Cheryl, his fictional wife Cheryl, actually break up because during sex, Larry can't stop talking about the difference between real crab and fake crab. And that fake crab is actually Alaska <laughs> Pollock. <laughs> so anyway, so number two, a much broader variety of it than we currently do. And then my third third and the three fur is mostly farmed filter feeders. So by that I mean mussels, oysters, clams. Why? Well, when you farm fish, you have to feed them stuff. You have to feed them 
sometimes other fish. I mean, in the case of salmon, it's usually more than a pound of wild fish to get a pound of salmon. Um, the other thing about the filtering, filter feeding bivalves is they clean the water, they provide structure, they provide good jobs. Um, and also within that filter feeding realm, I would also include kelp, though they're technically not filter feeding because they're plants, but they are absorbing excess nitrogen and phosphorus from the marine environment. And we are overloaded with that kind of stuff from all the agriculture mm -hmm. that we do. So if we can learn to farm the marine environment in a way that is um, restorative, then I think we could actually be on the right track to making more fish overall for our nation. You mentioned policy, and I'm curious if there are policies that are in place or that you think could be in place that would help us internationally manage this ocean resource and these fisheries. Well, there, you know, there's a big difference between national policy mm -hmm. and international policy. Um, n as I say, nationally, the United States is doing pretty well. Um, I would like to see a little bit more um, uh, access to aquaculture sites, particularly shellfish aquaculture. That's something that we can handle locally. Internationally, it's much more complicated. Um, the biggest challenge that we have as a world in terms of fisheries, aside from the whole kind of global climate change acidification stuff, which we can talk about, but the biggest real challenge is what's called IUU fishing, illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing. And about something like 20% of the wild fish that we import is coming to us from these illegal fisheries. When you have an illegal fishery, uh, when you're fishing illegally, it means it's completely outside of science. You know, the whole point of fisheries management is you gotta know how many fish there are, how many fish you're catching, how many you have to leave in the water. Without those three metrics, you cannot sustainably manage a fishery. So you can have very uh, sustainable fisheries out there where everyone's doing the right thing, but then if you have somebody coming in from the outside and taking that 20% out, then the whole system doesn't work. And you anticipated my next question, which is climate change. Mm -hmm. You know, is this a completely new ball game now for managing fisheries? What does this mean? Well, there's going to be uh, lots of changes. I mean, in my home, Long Island Sound, where I grew up, um, Long Island Sound is becoming like the Chesapeake. You know, whereas before Long Island uh, was known for its lobster, it's now increasingly known for its blue crab, which is a classic Chesapeake uh, Bay fishery. Mm -hmm. Um, in the Gulf of Maine, which was a classic codfish fishery, we're now seeing um, the mid-Atlantic fish, black sea bass there. And it's strange, you know, up, up there in Maine, they don't really have um, commercial quotas on black sea bass in the state of Maine. So they're there, but you can't really exploit them to the degree that they're exploitable because regulation can't catch up with the migration of fish. <laughs> so there's gonna be displacement along those things. The larger, more scary picture though, is what's gonna happen on a planktonic level. Mm. Um, one of the things that comes out a lot when I speak to plankton scientists is that the size of plankton is changing, that we seem mm -hmm. to be selecting for smaller plankton. And when you do that, you end up with a line that leads you towards smaller stuff, less edible stuff, less stuff that we like. I mean, it's not that the ocean's going to die, but it's not going to be the ocean that we evolved with. And that's the thing that we as humans need to be concerned about. Can these seafood ratings help us at all? There's been much more attention to sustainable seafood consumption recently. Do you see those rating systems being helpful for consumers? They, they, well, there's two questions. Are they helpful for consumers? And then are they actually doing anything? Um, a few years ago when I wrote about this in my first book, For Fish, um, studies, sort of meta-analyses of those different ratings programs found no sort of net effect on abundance of target species because of those rating systems. Now that was almost 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, there have been these like interesting like kind of nudges that things like Monterey Bay have created. Um, in Louisiana, for example, um, the state of Louisiana was one of the few holdouts in using what are called uh, TEDs. Th that's not the TED Talk, which <laughs> you can watch online of me, <laughs> but no. Um, uh, the, no, a TED is a tootle, uh, turtle excluder, excluding device. Mm -hmm. And it's basically a little escape hatch for turtles that you put on a shrimp trawl. It's a little complicated to use, but if you use it, the turtles don't die. So Louisiana was just holding out and not doing it. And shrimp in the Gulf um, had been getting, do you have the Monterey Bay seafood app? You, yeah. you, you students <laughs> must have it. So, you know, m most Gulf shrimp gets a yellow, but they put Louisiana in the red because they weren't complying with this TED function. Mm. It 
was a wake-up call, and suddenly um, the state government reversed its position, and now Louisiana fishermen are using the TEDs. So anecdotally, it works. The other thing I think it's really spurring is the creation of um, uh, a new aquaculture sector that is not so um, based on wild fish to feed other fish. Um, I know that Whole Foods, for example, has set out priorities where they want to have a what's called a fish in fish out ratio that's less than one to one. And there is some bending of the rules a little bit going on. Not exactly. I mean, they're using off cuts, in other words, carcasses and so forth that they can process into meal and oil that lowers the wild fish, farm fish ratio below one, one to one. So I don't think that would have happened if there hadn't been the pressure from places like the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Overall, I don't know. As for consumers, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, you know, you're a consumer. I mean, maybe you don't eat a lot of fish, but I mean, do you find that people use it when they go into the supermarket out here? I think some people do use it, and I think I hear a couple different things. People really appreciate how thorough it is, and then some people say, well, I'm a little bit confused. This yeah. is a bigger deal than just organic or not organic. Yeah. And, you know, it used to be, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, the question you asked at a restaurant was wild or farmed. That's right. So I, I'd love to hear your work has gotten into this, yeah. you know, more nuanced around these terms. Why is that maybe not the right question? Yeah, it's really not anymore. Um, it's really good wild and good farmed. Mm. And that's where the rating systems really are in a game of catch up to some degree. I mean, they've been following it pretty closely. But the difficulty is, you know, take Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, I think that their total Seafood Watch staff is like nine people. So nine people looking at all the fisheries of the world and trying to come up with a rating system. That's pretty tough. I mean, when you think about it, you know, the way the whole Monterey Bay Aquarium rating system began, it was totally inadvertent. They were doing a, an overfishing exhibit at the, at the aquarium. And somebody was like, oh, you know, we ought to check what we're serving in the restaurant in the aquarium. And it was like, oh. So from that initial impetus, people were like, oh, my God, this is really something we have to do. And... There's been a tremendous demand for it. I mean, I think hundreds of thousands, if not millions of those cards have been distributed. The app has been downloaded many, many times. But um, it's hard to keep pace with these things. So I think, if anything, it's, it's a little bit of like a backdoor reminder to fisheries. Because really, in an ideal world, um, the National Marine Fisheries Service in the United States, the fisheries agencies in the EU, the Common Fisheries Policy, they should be the rating service. Like, uh, this, the, there's a marine biologist named Daniel Pauly who said very wisely, it's like, it really shouldn't be up to the consumer to have to make this ecological choice. They should have agencies for whom sustainability is necessary and part of the law. Because when you think about it, what's the point of having an unsustainable fishery? Because you're not going to have any fish. <laughs> so it, it just makes good sense. So I think it insofar as those rating systems nudge government agencies towards having sustainability central to their fisheries management policy, then they're good. And then what could we expect to see as consumers if, if that were to happen? Would we see a shift in the types of fish that would be available, in the prices of fish? You mean if the government were to kind of adopt the Monterey Bay standards or? Yes, if, if all of the policies that you think would be most ideal were adopted, what would we see? What would change for us as fish consumers? Well. We'd see the IUU fish go away mm. if it became sort of the law of the land that you cannot sell, trade in, be involved in IUU fish in any way. You'd see things like tuna go away, not all of it, but some of it. You'd mm. see a lot of canned tuna go away. Um, you would see different kinds of exotic tropical species go away, a lot of reef fish like snapper and grouper. Um, again, there are good fisheries out there for those species, but you would see those things shaved away, hopefully, and not be sold somewhere else. I mean, the elephant in this whole room is China. Mm -hmm. um, China is the biggest catcher of fish in the world, and they are the biggest grower of aquacultured fish in the world. Mm -hmm. um, their involvement in the trading of seafood is integral. Like, one thing a lot of people don't know is that um, Alaskan salmon, for example, you know, that's probably everyone's first choice, right, in the West Coast. I would love to have some Alaskan salmon. Well, Alaska salmon quite often is frozen whole on the boat that catches it or at the factory. It's sent to China. It's defrosted, boned and filleted, refrozen, and comes back to us double frozen. So in China and Taiwan and a lot of these countries in Southeast Asia are these kind of pro wholesale processing centers for, in, during which a lot of 
identity of a lot of fish can get confused. So IEU fish can go in and come out as completely illegal products. So I really think a lot of pressure needs to be put on China and Taiwan to get them to adhere to the sustainability standards that more and more nations are adhering to. What are you learning in the research for your new book? Well, about the omega-3? Well, yeah. um, I'm learning a lot about you know these forage fish fisheries. And I should say I'm also doing a frontline documentary that's mm -hmm. kind of sort of on the same track, but a little bit different. It's actually more about salmon than anything else. But um, I was down in Peru looking at um, the effect of El Nino on the Peruvian Echeveta. And you probably don't know this, and maybe your viewers don't know either, but um, the Peruvian Echeveta is the sing biggest single species fishery in the world. So, you know, if there are 80 to 85 million metric tons of fish caught every year, 5 to 10 million metric tons are this fish that nobody knows about. And what's crazy about this fish, it's very delicious. I've been eating it like crazy. Um, have it on toast, do whatever I, you can with it. But 99%, it's the law of the land in Peru that 99% of it has to go into the fish meal and fish oil reducing plants and are turned into meal for aquaculture or turned into oil for supplements. So that's one thing I've certainly learned. I learned a lot about krill. I was down in the Antarctic. Um, uh, I was looking at the anchovy fishery in the Mediterranean. Um, geez, you know, there's so much I've learned. And now the biggest problem is trying to weave together the medical with the fishery science um, in a way that will hopefully not exclude the fishery nerds and not exclude <laughs> the super health conscious people. Oh, here's a good little fact I learned. I interviewed the creator of the... Um, of the um, paleo diet the other day. And we were talking about how, you know, just um, generally speaking, indigenous peoples tended to have a much better omega-3 to omega-6 ratio than Western uh, humans. So in the West, we can have ratios sometimes as bad as 50 to 1, 50 omega-6 to 1 omega-3. Meanwhile, Plains Indians apparently didn't, you know, had a fairly acceptable ratio or a good, a healthy ratio. And I was like, well, how did that happen? I mean, if there's, you know, they're Plains Indians, where are they getting their seafood from? Well, it turns out the Plains Indians, when they ate bison, ate the whole thing, including the brains. And mm -hmm. brains are a huge portion of, the, of, of a brain of an animal is DHA, which is one of the two uh, major omega-3 fatty acids. Wow. So that was something I learned along the way. <laughs> <laughs> I say that to you as somebody who works with ranchers and so forth. That, you know, if you just ate the, the brain. darn brains, if it wasn't for that mad cow disease, we'd all be eating brains. But it was pretty convincing. <laughs> There's a restaurant in my hometown that's been around for over 100 years or near to it, and they're famous for serving brains and eggs. But they had to stop because, well, of, the, because of the mad cow. The, well, you know, brains and eggs would be a great omega-3 boost because um, eggs, um, free-range free eggs, um, can have as much as 30 times more omega-3s than a, um, uh, you know, a, an industrial egg. So the egg together with the brains, dynamite. Who a, knew the ox was a health food restaurant? Yeah, that's right, a <laughs> brain omelet. That sounds great. But what I've been doing lately is actually I have my, my standard breakfast right now because I'm actually on a, on a, in a weight loss bet with a hedge fund guy <laughs> who I just know through my son's soccer program. <laughs> but we're on a weight loss bet, and so my standard breakfast now is a single free-range egg scrambled over canola oil because canola is a, the probably highest omega-3 oil. And then I take some salmon, uh, usually sock wild sockeye salmon, and then a dark, bitter, leafy green, which tends to be high in the ALA veg vegetable omega-3 fatty acid. And I make that into an omelet. And if anyone would like to follow along, I'm posting pictures of all my omega-3 meals at the hashtag Omega Principle, which is the title of the book. All right. Do you want to give us a preview of a dinner? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been doing really interesting things um, with kind of concoctions of mussels and salmon. Uh, mussel, you know, farm mussels and wild uh, Alaska salmon. Um, I've done uh, some really nice seafood stews. Um, I've done a lot of things. Um, so one of one of my favorite cooks um, and chefs is uh, the now deceased Marcella Hazan. Mm. Um, just a you know, she wrote a great book called Classics of, of Essentials of Classic Italian Cooking. So all right, so she has this classic meal where she does bucatini with sardines and fennel. So all good. Well, bucatini, a, a white pasta, not so great. So what I've been used doing is using a spiralizer to make zucchini pasta. So I have my zucchini pasta, and then I take sardines, as per what she says. Now, the recipe calls for pine nuts and raisins. I swap in walnuts and dried blueberries, because those are two very high ALA things. And then on top, in the Italian recipe, you're supposed to use breadcrumbs to kind of make it all mass together. I use flaxseed. 
And um, and then in addition, you know, the fennel, the wild fennel is is the green that you're supposed to use with it. Um, if I have wild fennel on hand, I'll use it. But I'm trying to incorporate other dark leafy greens. Um, purslane um, turns out to be very high in ALA omega-3 fatty acids. Um, it's generally what's an interesting thing about all the vegetable sources of omega-3s is that the wild weeds tend to be the ones that have the omega-3s, and um, the cultivated stuff has much lower omega-3. So, I mean, for somebody who loves to fish, bringing it full circle back to my, you know, why I fell in love with fishing, um, it's a way of interacting with the wild. It's like the omega-3 is like the wild fat, <laughs> and, and that's why I think it's really cool, and that's why I want to be involved with it. Do you still fish? I do fish. Um, I don't fish as much as I used to, not necessarily because of ethical reasons, but just because much of my time researching is spent on boats, and so to go out fishing is not necessarily the most conducive form of, or m most pleasurable thing for me anymore. Although, back in New York, things are starting to thaw, and we actually got a mackerel run for the first time in a few years. We usually, we previously, when I was a kid, we used to have mackerel run every spring. We haven't seen them in a, many, many years, but they've shown up in the spring, and I'm like tensing to go, but we keep getting 30, 40 mile an hour winds, and I can't get out. So, if the winds die down while the mackerel are still here, I will go fishing for them this month. And does uh, taking your kids fishing skip a generation in your family? Or I have tried. <laughs> I've really tried. You know, my son is the unwitting victim of much of my journalism. So I've taken him fishing and written pieces about him. I wrote a piece um, last year. We went to Sicily uh, for the New York Times travel section. And I wrote this whole story about trying to get a kid who doesn't like to eat fish to eat fish. And so we went all over Sicily. The, the greatest moment was when, um, uh, so, you know, classic Italian dish is squid ink pasta. In my house, I make it, but it's just black pasta. You know, it's just, it comes in a box, it's black. And my son loves it. He's like, oh, can you make that black pasta? We ordered it in Sicily, and it was white pasta in a puddle of squid ink. And my son just looked at it, and I, you know, I could see his eyes <laughs> welling up. <laughs> You're not really going to make me eat that. <laughs> but I've taken him fishing a few times. I mean, he's like marginally interested in it. But I do think the gene might be sort of one of those recessive things that skips over, and maybe my grandchild will <laughs> be a fisher person. <laughs> I hope somebody to keep me company in my dotage. <laughs> and then, can you leave us with your favorite fish? Do you have a favorite seafood? Well, you know, on every coast, I have my favorites. Um, sorry, and you know, uh, here on the West Coast, um, so, so if you're a fisherman, if you're a fisher, um, the way a fish fights and behaves influences how you sort of feel about its flesh. I know that sounds tremendously primitive, and the vegans in the audience are going to be like, ugh, that's disgusting. But for me, pound for pound, the greatest fighter on the West Coast is the Pacific Yellowtail, yeah. also called Hamachi. And I've caught them off the Channel Islands. I've caught them off Catalina. And they're just a great, tremendous fighter. And then they have this nice, firm, white flesh that's very clean tasting, but still has a little bit of bite to it. And you can smoke it. You can broil it. Um, it, it doesn't fall apart on a grill like, say, a codfish will. So for the West Coast, I choose the yellowtail. All right. Wonderful. And uh, maybe one more for another, for another location here? Oh, OK. Well, on the East Coast, let's see. The East Coast, I, um, I'm a fan of the haddock um, for different reasons. Um, haddock will fall apart on the grill. It is a flaky fish. And it's actually in cod, classic cod nations like Scotland and so forth, they actually prefer haddock to cod. One, because haddock don't have worms in them. Like cod will often have worms. And they, they, with codfish fillets, they do this thing called candling, where they'll put the fillet under a bright light, and the worms come out, and then they pluck them out. So that's a little disgusting. <laughs> haddock don't have the worms. And also haddock, um, I don't, you know, this is not really good food science, but they eat a lot of shellfish, and their flesh has almost a kind of shrimp-like taste. And they perform really well in a classic fish and chips where it's not just a dough delivery system. It's an actual flavorsome, delicious piece of fish that you can really enjoy. Thank you so much, Paul. Oh, thank you, Liz. It was a pleasure. So I've been visiting with Paul Greenberg, and this is Liz Carlisle. You're watching Edible Education.